vectors here, you have the wave activity fluxes computed from the regression of these string function anomalies. And uh, for the DJF season, uh, let's see first the day zero, which is when uh, we have a positive phase of the pattern. So here in the southern tip of South America, you see this cir uh, cyclonic circulation here, which would be enhancing convection in the southeastern South America region, and then we get this uh, positive anomaly to the north. And uh, if you see the evolution, we can see mostly a subpolar uh, sub wave thing here, uh, building up to this cyclonic anomaly in South America that will then be causing this positive phase of the pattern. Uh, there are also several other features which are more, um, more present in another uh, months, like for October, November, you can see this uh, intense anticyclonic anomaly here uh, in the west of the Antarctic Peninsula that in previous studies has been shown to be a precondition of the uh, precipitation here in southeastern South America. So we also see that type of uh, anomaly with the regression patterns. And if we see the animation here, yeah. You, uh, you can see that these are quasi-stationary patterns that oscillate uh, to form this, uh, this cyclonic anomaly uh, in South America towards day zero, and then favor uh, precipitation in the southeastern South America region. Um, this is more likely to what you said, Andy, that you can see the, the wave change, not like clearly propagating, but just like this standing oscillation there in the, in the evolution. So regarding the rainy season and the intersectional variability in 30 to 90 days, uh, we were wondering if this activity that we saw in the tropical region might be related to the Madden Julian oscillation. And for that, we used uh, another study in which we used the RMM index to characterize the MGO, and we found similar results with the OMI index. And in this case, for each season, we related the RMM index to rainfall in South America following uh, Wheeler for 2009. And we computed composites of the probability of weekly, uh, of seven day running mean weekly rainfall exceeding the upper third side. And we expressed that as a ratio to 0.33. So a value of one would mean that there's a nominal probability of exceeding the upper third side, and value of 1.5 would mean that that probability uh, increases in a 50%, and so on. So this was what we got for DJF season. So these colors would mean that the probability of exceeding this upper thermal in the weekly average rainfall uh, would be higher than normal, and then this below normal. And we found, uh, after applying statistical uh, significance using Monte Carlo techniques, that there was a dipolar signal related to the different phases of the MJO, mostly around phases three to five, and which was, was shown with the, in I think was uh, Tuesday, this lecture that you show the, how to use the chips data set and the area data library to make composites of the RMM phases. I performed like the same uh, for like, this region here. And you still get to see this dipolar signal uh, between the Sachs region and the uh, Southeastern South America region and the opposite phase, maybe on RMM phases one and eight. So there seems to be a, there could be a relationship there. So if you see this, uh, the location of the convective centers between phases three to five, you could see it around the Indian Ocean and moving towards the maritime continent. And this would be related to a positive phase of the cis pattern. And in that positive phase on day zero, what we saw is that the convection anomalies were located actually in the same region as these phases. So, yeah, and this was the wavelength that was uh, present in the same day as this. So this wavelength doesn't necessarily mean that was generated by, uh, by this, um, this location of the, of the negative anomaly, but it takes the time to build up and then to impact in South America. And to test, to test that from another point of view, we used uh, an MJO index uh, mm -hmm. computed uh, following Jones uh, of 2012, 
Uh, in this case, uh, they use the combined VOF of 200 hectopascal and 800 hectopascal, uh, sonal wind differential anomalies, and they were filtered in the 20 to 200 days. And they use this type of index uh, with uh, to analyze the intraseasonal variability of the Marvin Julian oscillation. Uh, and they say that the advantages respect to the RMM index is that without uh, as not taking convection as a part of the index and mostly analyze the circulation and that makes it less noisy and detect better the isolated MGO events. Uh, so you can analyze the PC1 and PC2 of this type of combined UOF as you did for the RMM1 and 2. And uh, using this type of index, we define the MGO coherent events also following Jones, in which the amplitude should be greater than 0.9 during the whole event. Uh, there should be also a, an eastward propagation uh, along the whole event in the RMM diagram that would be a counterclockwise rotation, and the event should last at least 25 days. That should define the MGO coherent event. And uh, on the other hand, we defined using the 3096 index, which was the principal component associated to the EOF, uh, positive and negative events that those are which last at least five consecutive days above or below one standard deviation. So an example for one season is that here we have the 3096 index in black, the MGO amplitude in the dashed line and shaded in yellow, and then you see the MGO phase computed with this index. Here it's from one to eight, and then you see that these steps as if the MGO changes of phase and propagates towards the east. But it was a really nice example of the, uh, uh, of the evolution of both indexes. And what we tried to do was to see the simultaneous uh, relation between the CIS index and the phases in which the MGO phases occur uh, following what uh, our previous studies. And what we found are some uh, diagrams like this. So this is the, would be like MGO phase diagram. The yellow diamond would be the time when the positive cis phase was uh, maximum. And then you get to see the evolution of the different days uh, along this uh, phase diagram. What you could see is that in the positive cis events, they mostly occur during MGO phases three to six, while the negative cis events uh, are producing uh, between phases seven to two. This is coherent which what, with what we were expecting from this type of work when we analyze the local signal of precipitation associated to the uh, MGO anomalies. And also with this analysis, uh, respect to the location of the convective centers, or in this case they are, this is the CPC figure composites for the uh, velocity potential anomalies following the tropics. So then you get in phases uh, four and five, this, uh, the location of the maximum diversion is here on the maritime continent, which is most of all we found here using the uh, signal of the PC1 in this region. And for the negative events, you could see that uh, in this case, it was 24 days before the, the peak of the positive phase. So that would be uh, a period of around 50 days in the change of signs. And you can see that uh, the convection has positive anomalies here in the maritime continent, which would be related to these maximum conversions here. So from another perspective, uh, Another thing we did was we took all the values of the CIS index that uh, occur along the, the season and then we did categorize them according to the MGO phase uh, that was uh, observed in that day. This all during MGO coherent events. And what we found in that way that is that uh, in this case we are not considering only the CIS events but we're seeing all the values of the CIS index that uh, for phases between three to six, you have a higher probability of having a positive index uh, in these phases. Whereas when you have an MGO phase from seven to two, there is a higher probability of getting a negative cis index in those phases. 
and analyzing uh, individual cases, we could uh, we could associate this mostly the most part of these negative values to an evolution of the sys index that came from negative values maybe on phase three, and then it had its peak on phase phases on phases five and six, as well as these negative values in these phases were associated to this in, uh, the evolution of the indices that peak uh, in the phases three and four. Remember that there's around the in the mean that you can spend the MGO spends around uh, five to six days in each phase, so uh, the MGO propagates to the east and the phase evolves uh, to a higher values. Then you get maybe six days differences between uh, different phases in the mean. So every MGO event is different, but then you can see like a temporal evolution here. So the highlights for the rainy season is that the leading pattern of intersectional variability is still a dipole, explain around 21.5% of the variance. And associated to the uh, variability in South America, we could see that there was a really progression of MGO-like tropical convection anomalies to the east. Uh, and there was some seasonal differences even within the rainy season. Uh, we could also observe extratropical wave trains uh, seem to link uh, that convective anomalies to the extratropical uh, activity in South America. And through uh, studying the MGO uh, impact in South America, we could associate these uh, similarities to the MGO-like progression anomalies to actually the MGO circulation and uh, positive cis events in that, uh, in that sense occur mostly between phases three to six. So uh, to address uh, what I left here is that we need to analyze better this MGO signal to study which are the precursors of the cis events and not only the simultaneous relation between the MGO phase and the cis events. And I also wanted to repeat this uh, characterization of MGO events using the OMI index uh, which is an index that uh, uses only the OLA, so you can see only the convective, um, uh, the convective signal of the MGO without this influence of the circulation associated. And uh, also this is filtered, so I've never seen a, another, uh, a phase diagram of the OMI index. I don't know how smooth it is as it evolves, but I hope it's less noisy than the RMM index, so it's less tricky to define these intense MGO events. So for the dry season, uh, we also get uh, the EOF leading pattern. It's only uh, one center, of, has only one center of action in the same region of within the 10 to 90 day band of variability. And uh, as I pointed out before, we don't see a, and such an intense signal in the tropical convection as we've seen for the rainy season, but you can still see some anomalies there propagating around the tropics in the Indian Ocean. Uh, during the phase, uh, the positive phase of the pattern, where this pattern is uh, reaching its maximum values, you can see that there are uh, convective inhibition here in the Indian Ocean. And regarding the wave trains, uh, maybe we can see the animation here. You can see the influence of not only the exotropics building up to these anomalies in South America, but also. Uh, of the tropical region. Here that you see the different uh, sign of the wave trains also resembling the BSA patterns that they pop up uh, not only in the transitional time scale, in the annual time scale. And this also seems to be more like quasi stationary wave trains and not a propagating signal. You can also see this splitting of the of the wave trains during the, the social winter season. So what's left here is to analyze which is the, exactly the source of these wave trains. And you could see this uh, formation of the positive center uh, in the Indian Ocean that moves slowly towards the east as the pattern in South America evolves. So just for competition, I'm showing this figure, though we are not such uh, as conclusive as during the rainy season, but for the positive cis events, we see that uh, between phases uh, six and one, the, uh, you can get most of them, but though they are less events of the MGO and also uh, they seem to be shorter in this season. 
at least as they are uh, computed from this uh, Jones index. And then from the negative cis events, you see that mostly between phases two to five, but you can still see some uh, negative events in, in those phases, so that's not as conclusive as for the summer season. For the positive uh, cis events, uh, really quick, we see that the most, uh, most of them occur between phases seven and eight, which would be these ones in the velocity potential progression, and this uh, upper level conversions might be related to these uh, centers here in the tropical Indian Ocean. So the highlights for this dry season is that the pattern is monopole, as we've seen in the 10 to 90 days variability. They are not as clearly related to tropical convection as they, as they were during the rainy season. Uh, but you can still see extratropical wave prints observed along which energy is propagated and also along the subtropical latitude resembling the PSA pattern. As I mentioned before, the relation is not clear between the CIS and MTO as it was during the rainy season. And uh, we also need to address these uh, precursors of the CIS events here, though I don't know how um, Given that the relation is not as clear, I don't know how, what we could expect if they are coming from the MGO signal or not, and also using the OMI index. So for the show interest variability, this was uh, more similar to what um, Liebman in 1999 showed in the evolution of the SAC, uh, or Van der Ville, like they, they were focused most without leaving out the transients in the uh, two, to ten, uh, two, two to 10 day period. But in this case, we're analyzing the short interstitial variability. And the same way we computed the uh, CIS pattern as the leading UF in this region. And we see that there are some seasonal differences uh, that we pointed out before. Uh, but still, we could, uh, we performed this uh, regression evolution using the separate uh, PC1s associated to these patterns. And we saw a similar features that we could get when we use only one pattern across the whole seasons, and then uh, dividing the PC1 and performing regressions from this pattern. So uh, no, not only for the sake of simplicity, but also uh, for making easier the task of monitoring uh, uh, tools that we are trying to develop, we chose to stick to only one pattern and analyze the seasonal dependence using that one. I think I have the animation somewhere here. Yeah. So it's uh, this uh, evolution is for from 15 days before the peak of the positive phase in South America. And as you can see, there are some really interesting seasonal differences, which is were somewhat expected. Uh, if you see, we've been talking about winter in this short interstitial time scale, you still get these uh, two patterns. It, and as you can see, this seem more clearly to be propagating into South America and not just like a standing oscillation as the 30 to 90 patterns. Um, also, you can see this splitting of the wave plane evolution uh, along the subpolar wave, the subtolar, the sub polar wave plane and the subtropical wave planes. And uh, in the OLA evolution, you can also trace back these centers towards the uh, subtropical um, region of, associated to the sub South Pacific Convergence Zone. So I don't know what would, it would mean in, in a sense of a source, but uh, it was a difference related uh, respect to the other seasons. They, it was also there in the spring season, but not as quite there in summer and March, April, and May. So in this case, it takes around 15 to 17 days for the pattern to evolve from a negative phase to another negative phase or from a positive phase to another positive phase. And some of the theories that we got for explaining this evolution of variability in this case, obviously, we weren't expecting tropical convection anomalies like MGO to be related to the evolution of these patterns, but it was suggested to us that the, uh, 
the SPCC could, uh, could have an influence in, in what sense, in a nonlinear sense, as there were studies from Raup in 2008 and 10, in which they show that uh, uh, there could be a nonlinear processes of resonance uh, of equatorial waves, and in, they analyzed like, the resonance between three different types of waves, and uh, when they they use the convective coupled wave there, then you can get the resonance in the interseasonal variability time scale that could evolve towards uh, South America, uh, the signal. And so they associated that process with tropical convection. So that's one of the, uh, of the theories we have. Uh, then the leading pattern uh, of variability, as uh, I've shown before, shows this uh, subpolar wave trains acting in the Pacific Ocean, and also as of tropical ones, mostly in spring and also winter. And those end up enhancing uh, convection in the southeastern South America region, and they seem more like the propagation of the patterns of the PSA patterns, and not uh, like a standing oscillation. Um, and then what we need to address in this variability band that it was uh, mostly less studied than the uh, variability associated to the modern Julian oscillation is how do nonlinear process, processes influence in the region, which is the origin of the four things. Also, I don't know if analyzing separate case studies would allow us to avoid this smoothing and then detecting uh, the sources of this variability more, um, more, I don't know how to say, sorry. And just to close up, this is, uh, we're currently, as I told you before, uh, trying to use this cis pattern to monitor the evolution of the uh, interseasonal variability of rainfall in South America. So we are currently in this, this web page. We have several tools of, uh, of weekly monitoring and also uh, sub-seasonal forecasts using the climate forecast system version two model for precipitation temperature at a level uh, geopotential heights on our air. And we, we also uh, modify the algorithm to compute the uh, SIS index in a quasi real time uh, way. I don't know if you're familiar for working in real time with interseasonal indexes that, the, that involve filtering. It's not quite trivial because you can't filter in real time using a bandpass filter. So it's tricky to adapt the methodology to, uh, to compute the real time index. Uh, when you want to use an interseasonal index to monitor variability. So then in this page, you can select each of the station, the weather station located in this region to see the house evolution of precipitation there. And you also get the quasi real time CIS index. This was for uh, the winters, also winter that passed. And this is where well, it's computed in real time. And you see that here in this positive values that occurred between the end of September and October, you could see that there was an enhancement of consecutive days of precipitation. In this case, I think that the weather station is one around here that I selected for this. Uh, for this. So this is currently where we are going to, uh, trying to develop these monitoring and prediction tools, but we also don't wanna leave all the dynamics behind, so we need to, to currently address most of the influence that was suggested here. So. If you have another suggestion for um, uh, different diagnostics that we can address or regress, then it will be, I will be taking those back home and then performing them to, to continue studying this evolution. So thank you.